Mm -hmm. So our coffee break series is a series that's been going on for a couple of years at Abington Art Center. Um, basically, it happens every Saturday or every second Saturday of the month at Abington Art Center. It's sponsored by the Jenkintown Lyceum and we have our artists or our jurors for a particular show come in and talk about the work. Um, so our speaker for today is uh, the juror of our annual juried show, Michael Gallagher. Michael Gallagher is a painter whose work moves freely between abstraction and representation. His work is represented by the Schmidt Dean Gallery where he's had seven solo exhibitions and been included in numerous group exhibitions. He is also a professor of the BFA MFA programs at the Pennsylvania Academy of Fine Art where he's a six time recipient of the Excellence in Teaching Award. Please join me in giving a warm welcome to Michael Gallagher. Okay, thanks, Jean. Hello, everyone. Um, I was asked to speak about my work and that came as a surprise. Anyway, welcome everyone. Uh, and I told Jean that I would do anything that I was asked to do within reason, so what, what I thought I would do is welcome everyone in and uh, maybe spend five minutes just talking a little bit about my work, uh, once again, because I was asked to do that. And I, I thought what I would do is show two bodies of work from recent exhibitions. Um, I had an exhibition back in March. It, we were two weeks in um, before the COVID hit. So it was a short run, but there was an online, there is an online catalog for it. So I, I thought I would move through that quickly. I'd share that with you. And then I'm currently in a group exhibition at Cerulean Gallery in Philly. And the reason that might be worthwhile looking at is because the uh, images there are being, uh, they're, they're the figurative, they're the still life paintings that I do. So Jean, I'm clicking on share screen. Okay. There we go. Okay. It wasn't working. So I was freaking a little bit, Jean, but working now. All right. Is anyone seeing it? I'm not seeing it. Oh, here we go. I got it. Okay. Hey, Jean, and you're, you're going to be my voice, okay? Sounds good. You'll be my conduit to reality here because I need that. So. Oh, it went away. <laughs> hang on. I think it's opening it up. Okay. So what are we seeing now? I'm seeing all of our beautiful participants. Okay. <laughs> You're not seeing this catalog? No. Okay. That's a shame. What are you seeing now? All of your beautiful participants? <laughs> yes. Okay. Very soon. Well, this is going swimmingly. <laughs> Let me try something else here. How's everyone doing, by the way? Oh, they're muted. They can't say anything. We're going to be in trouble if I can't share this PowerPoint, Gene. OK, this well, give it a moment. All right. As you start screen sharing. There we go. I'm seeing some type of a, a dancing window here. I'm seeing some type of catalog. Okay. Oh, there we go. <laughs> Beautiful. Wait a minute. What do you see now? All right. Now I see your work. Okay. So let's get on track here. These are images from the uh, Cerulean show that is up right now. And, and one of the things that hopefully I can show the catalog for the Schmidt Dean show, uh, one of the things that's apparent is that I work as the introduction mentioned between, you know, two different visual languages that are very different. Uh, but that are also very similar in my mind. So these are four still lifes that are currently on exhibition at Cerulean. Cerulean is located in Center City. Uh, it's a reoccurring motif that I use, uh, flowers and birds uh, in a sort of still life motif. So these are four examples. And let me see if I can get to the catalog here, Eugene, because that's what I really want to show was the full-blown show at Schmidt Dean of abstraction. So what are you seeing now, Gene? 
I'm seeing the catalog. Very nice. Now, I'm reticent to go full screen because that's when I lost you, but I want to go full screen. So here we go, folks. Let's try full screen. We'll go dark for a second, as is reflective of our times. Okay, beautiful. You see that? Yes. God bless us. Here we go. We're going backwards in time. See how this works. So I can get to the cover and walk us through. Once again, it's somewhat slow. If you hear something in the background, it's a hamster. It's a hamster? Do it. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm babysitting a hamster from for some students who had to go home. So we have a recent addition. I'm going out of full screen, Gene. Okay. Because it's just too slow. Gotcha. And by the way, well, I'm trying to get this over and done with uh, give folks a context. I'll take them out. Take him outside. Oh. All right. What do you see now, Gene? I see your I see your painting nice and big on your screen. Okay. Okay. So I'm gonna do this. I'm losing control here. I don't quite know how to get out of this. Perhaps what I'll do, because this is going swimmingly, uh, not, uh, is I can send the link to folks who are interested. Anyway, at the end of the day, it was an exhibition. It was my largest exhibition to date. Uh, we got two weeks in. It was comprised of primarily abstract paintings that had similar motifs, landscapes with birds and still life uh, sort of in a very abstract language, but still imagery that was recognizable within that degree of abstraction. And the COVID impacted it obviously. And, uh, and that was that. So when Jean asked me to be a part of this exhibition, I was very excited because I love looking at art and I really love looking at what folks are doing out in the world independently. And I love community centers that give the opportunity for folks to show their work. So I've done this about six or seven times now, and I'm going to share screen with images from the exhibition. And I'm gonna walk through them uh, and talk about the work and what I thought about uh, the work and why I chose it. And we're waiting here for the magic to happen. And I apologize for all of these. Okay, what do we see now, Gene? We're seeing our first piece. Okay, which is not even. supposed to be our first piece. So we're gonna go backwards in time here, right? And hope that once we get up and running, we'll be good. Okay, so let's get to getting. I guess the first thing to say is that I always find this very daunting. Uh, it's a challenge to look at a lot of work it's a challenge to make tough decisions about, you know, what you can show and what you can't. There's always limited real estate, obviously, with any one of these real-time exhibitions. You know, you know, maybe the good thing about the, the, the so-called COVID situation is that, you know, we're doing everything virtually now. So, you know, you can open up exhibitions to more work. But at the end of the day, when it's a real exhibition in real time, in real space, you have to make hard decisions. So uh, one of the things that I always strive to do is to try to show as broad a range of work as I possibly can. And that's, there's no mission behind that other than, you know, the, the fact that I like a lot of different types of work. Uh, my tastes are very broad. Uh, it gets me in trouble sometimes, certainly. Uh, I've been able to navigate that broad range of taste in my own, you know, work and I've been lucky enough to be able to do the abstractions and the more representational works. But I, I find that when I am looking at exhibitions, I always enjoy ones, you know, that cast a wide net. 
So whenever I'm charged with an exhibition, uh, choosing works, making hard decisions, uh, I sort of let my intuition take over and I don't try to overthink things. If the image, if the object uh, attracts my immediate attention, uh, I run with it. So what I did was I took everything and I put them in a PowerPoint presentation. I got a prompt from, uh, uh, you know, the, the gallery and they said, well, we can maybe fit 40 to 45 works. So I had a number to work with and then I did the painful process of eliminating work. So if anyone's in the group uh, who submitted and didn't get something in, know that I looked at everything and I, and I made hard decisions and sometimes works that didn't get in, uh, maybe didn't get in because I already had three or four works that seemed to be doing something similar. All right, so I hope that's clear to everyone. So let's let's move through the images, and uh, if the if the if the artist is 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 in the house and they want to comment on the work, that that would be certainly fine with me. So uh, if Alice is in the in 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 the the group and Alice wants to unmute, that works for me. And I'll just have to say this image was really uh, very very powerful in terms of how the light is being used, how the light, you know, sort of moves through and illuminates all of the forms. I, I think the other thing that was very apparent in all the work that came in uh, for the most part was that the lion's share of it was obviously a response to the summer and, and, and what we were dealing with, you know, as a, as a, as a country. Um, and the way that people were navigating, you know, the lockdown uh, and it was reflected in not only the work, but, you know, in the titles. So I, I, I appreciate the titles. Uh, this one in particular, Code Beige, you know, that uh, maybe the overarching color of the painting moves towards a kind of beige uniformity. Uh, but I, the, the first thing that attracted me was certainly the, uh, the, the, the beautiful light that illuminates the whole scene. Uh, I got a kick out of the uh, the tent, you know, we were locked down, but man, we needed to get out. So I can, only, I can only imagine, you know, the wonderful stories that were happening in the backyard there with ways of coping. Is Alice here with me? Yeah, I'm here. Alice, can you, can you hear me? I can hear you. And, and I, I, I love the piece. Well, thank you. And I really enjoyed seeing it when I was laying out the exhibition and I'm hoping that everyone uh, well, I don't know, Jean, are you open? Are you gonna be open at all? Yeah, we're going to be open. We have limited gallery visitation hours due to COVID. So uh -huh. we're open Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, okay. 9 to 6 p.m. You don't need to make an appointment. You can just show up. We will be oh, closed okay. on Christmas and New Year's though. Yeah, very good. And, and here's the other thing. Uh, Jean and I got together and we laid out the exhibition. And you know, that's another thing that I take uh, great joy in doing because it's wonderful to see this image. It's going to be much better to see this image in the flesh because all of the best things in my mind about objects, visual art that, you know, are resolved in their objectness is being able to see them, to see the brushwork, to see the size, to see its relationship with the works that it has been placed next to because uh, Jean and I took you know, we took our time and we placed the work so that the works started to not only shine in their own right, but to really elicit interesting conversations from, you know, the works that they were uh, surrounded by. So I'm hoping that everyone can get over to the center and see your exhibition in real time. So Alice, do you want to say something about this beautiful work? Well, you're making me laugh because by the end of the summer, there were three tents on this <laughs> this this deck. Yeah. Like they were all like smooshed together. And my son was like, it was like a village basically. So this was actually just the beginning. Um, and the title comes from him, he's five. And mm -hmm. um, he was playing with an older boy next door for most of the summer. There was like nobody, you know, we didn't really do much of anything. And this next door neighbor is all into like code red code green and my son had never heard that kind of stuff and they would do this thing with like it's code red and they go hide but my son was like code magenta 
like artist <laughs> kid, right? And then he starts talking about go beige. And I just thought that was so funny. I couldn't get it out of my head. And it just felt um, like a fitting title because it's like alarming, but kind of like funny and calming at the same time. And there's something really alarming about the fact that we were under quarantine over the summer or isolating, but then it was also nice. We were together and I just felt like code beige kind of summed it up, but he was kind of making me laugh because he was coming up with, you know, code magenta is even more serious than code red mommy. And um, that that's sort of where that title came from. And it's painted in my yard. Um, somebody asked about the size. So I don't usually paint this big. And I, I think, um, I just was so frustrated. You know, we were all cooped up. I'm a teacher, so I was teaching from home, high school, art. And I was like, I just need to paint big. And so I just took two um, canvases I had that were 24 by 36 and I put them vertically. So um, I think I said the right answer, 36 by 48 when you add it all up. Mm -hmm. um, and I just worked in my yard throughout the summer on it. And um, yeah, it would just watch the different things he was doing and talking about and just sort of, kept adding stuff as it happened. So were you out there with an easel? Was this a plane yeah. you're painting? Yeah, oh yeah, yeah. Um, I'm, at, I'm, I'm standing in front of a shed where there uh -huh. were a million mosquitoes. So yeah. I would have to wear, I had to wear long pants and wool socks. There was no way every time and it was hot. Um, yeah. For me, painting is always like me versus the mosquitoes and yeah. the heat. So yeah, I, had, I would just take them out there and um, the big canvases. Sometimes I would just work on one, you know, but I had to kind of keep lining them up to make sure it was kind of matching. And yeah, I just did them on location. That's beautiful. Well, you know, uh, since I, 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 listen, I'm not against ca uh, cameras and photos. I'm, I'm all for it. Uh, but it, it does my heart good to know that this was a plain air painting. First of all, because I know how difficult that is. <laughs> it's very difficult to, because, you know, the first thing I thought was, well, this is a painting about light, right? And obviously, it's a painting about light. But, you know, some folks might say, well, this is a painting about a backyard in a suburban environment, you know. But no, first and foremost, to me, it's a painting that privileges this idea about how light moves through an environment. And mm -hmm. I know how difficult that is to do if you are painting plain air. If this is from a <laughs> photograph, then you you know once which once again is fine. I'm not anti-photograph, but I'm right. saying it's hard to make a painting like this that is about light because the light keeps changing. And the other thing that I was thinking, and, and once again, I really like to look at images, and because I don't have the luxury of time to look at images as much as I would like to, because I have so many images on my plate, I'm seeing all these little nuances now. So there's your son, yeah, and he's in yeah. there. And you know the interesting thing about light is it offers up, you know, both illumination, but there's also a sort of a camouflaging here, mm -hmm. right? You know, you, you get sort of disoriented in this scene because the light is doing this, this sort of fracturing, mm -hmm. uh, which is a sort of a form in my mind of a kind of, you know, uh, camouflage. But, you know, as we take our time and we move through the image, you, you offer up all of these wonderful little events so now there's a figure on the porch that I didn't see before. If I go to the right side of the house, there's some sort of like little vessel over there, some sort of purple blue vessel. His wagon, yeah. Okay. <laughs> Wonderful little elements to light upon and to take you know pleasure in looking at. So it puts me in mind of Fairfield Porter. <laughs> yeah. So I don't know if you're familiar with. Oh Porter. yeah. Okay. Yeah. But, you know, and once again, I'm very old school and I get in trouble for this, but I'm always thinking about, you know, artwork and its context, either mm -hmm. it's contemporary context or perhaps it's historical one. And I think of art as a conversation, both, you know, current and, and, and conversations, you know, back into time. So uh, kudos. It's a beautiful work. Well, thank you. I appreciate yeah. it. Yeah, thanks for doing the exhibit. I was glad I could enter something so big. So no, I, 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 when I got there, I thought, oh, we could have squeezed more work in, but I, but I think we did a good job, right, Jean? We did a good job. Yeah, we did a. It's <laughs> about just about perfect. <laughs> yeah. Very amount of work. All right, I guess I better pick up the pace, Jean. Here's the other thing: you better keep an eye on me. Yes, I, I know I, you like you value the critique, but we have a lot of art to get to. I like the critique. <laughs> okay, All right. I, and I want to share everything. So I really enjoyed this. The interesting thing about this is that I didn't have any 
context uh, in terms of scale. I, I don't, I didn't, I wasn't looking at the dimensions of the works first. I was looking at the images. Uh, and, and obviously, you know, this was once again a comment, at least in my mind, and how could it not, uh, with regard to where we were as a culture. And I thought it was uh, a, a whimsical one. And I didn't get to the fact that it was a so called chair until after the fact, which gave it another element. And then I thought, wow, is this a full size chair? Because I think there was another submission that also used the chair motif from the same artist. So is Beth here? Beth is actually not here. Okay, all right. But anyway, I got a kick out of this piece and uh, it's wonderful because actually, you know, it's, it's a very small piece, but it, it, it has real presence in the exhibition. So here we go, 2020 chair, makes sense to me, right? There we go. So this was an interesting submission because these two sculptures were made by an artist who's no longer with us. Uh, I really wanted to include both of them because I didn't think that, you know, I mean, I, I, I really was attracted to both of them. And I, I was so trying to keep the numbers down. I wasn't sure if I was going to be able to include both, uh, but we were able to. And once again, I, I think uh, in the installation, uh, they really shine because we were able to, uh, the decision was to either put them on a single pedestal or to separate them on, on separate pedestals and, and sort of ha have them sort of call and respond to one another in the room, which is exactly what they do. Uh, they're wonderful pieces. They're really well made. Uh, they have a wonderful whimsy to them. And uh, I was just very happy that we could accommodate both of them because I, I think they benefit from uh, one another. Um, you know, they, they gain strength because between one another. So are, are the folks who submitted these two works with us? Yes, I believe they are. Um, the artist's name is Margot Summers and Bridget Burlesque uh, submitted these. Yes, um, okay. Bridget, I'm Bridget, I'm here. Um, uh, yes, uh, my uh, stepson, BJ, uh, well, I was uh, explaining to him that I was, uh, had, was going to submit something and, and I asked him if he was um, open to having these pieces from, that were created by his grandmother, Margaret Summers, um, in, the, in the show. And he was very excited. He said that uh, he, th he thought that she would, um, you know, she would love to have her work shared, uh, you, you know, even beyond, uh, beyond her lifespan. So um, we, we've enjoyed them for quite a while. And um, she was indeed uh, a very joyful, joyous person. And she uh, enjoyed traveling a great deal. And she was in love with the, the uh, sea. And so this is, this is her inspiration for these pieces. And she's, she actually did several, uh, she did a series of pieces and these are within that series. And um, that's, you know, I, he, she did them toward the end of her life and BJ was very um, instrumental in having them cast. He was uh, part of the process, you know, he, he delivered them to the, um, I'm sorry, I forget the word where, you know, to the, to the place where you would the foundry, cast them. Foundry. Foundry, foundry, correct. He delivered them to the foundry and, and he um, was a lot, he was, you know, wanted, wanting to make sure that everything was safely done and he was involved in their casting a, a, a great deal. So um, I, I was glad to be able to submit them for him. Well, you know, I have to say it's the first time in, in, in doing, you know, these community-based uh, art center exhibitions uh, where we had a posthumous submission and I was really glad that, uh, you know, the institution was flexible enough to accommodate them because I, you know, I, I live in a world of, you know, I teach in an art school. <laughs> so I, I live in a world of bureaucracies and I, I, I love the flexibility of Abington to, you know, go with the flow here and they're beautiful pieces. And uh, I, I, the artist's name again, help me out. Margaret Summers. Yeah. Uh, so she, I, I, uh, she, uh, she, uh, she, 
uh, studied and did, started working in um, in New York, like the Long Island area in the mm -hmm. late 50s. And these pieces were completed um, around the early 2000. And she, she died in, I believe, 2005. OK, yeah. So I'm sorry I don't have the name here. Uh, I apologize. But uh, I, I hope everyone can get to the show and, and see the works once again in real time. Uh, so that you can really appreciate. This is the bad thing about sculpture when it comes to reproducing them uh, via slides. You know, you I mean, let's face it, you, you really need to be able to see a three dimensional object that's meant to be seen, you know, in real time. Uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah and they are actually, they are, I mean, just for people's information, they're like the, the merman is about 17 or 18 inches tall above the um, marble, uh, that he's sitting on, and the the uh, mermaid is a little bit smaller than that, just just yeah. an, in, just an inch or so. So they're they're you know they're they are interesting, um, formidable in quite in their own way. Yeah. So very good. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. I really appreciate them. All right, here we go. You know the other thing that if if folks don't know about Zoom, what Zoom does when you're using it, at least my experience and maybe Gene can back me up. It sucks the life out of your computer. So when you're trying to move through images, like I was trying to do with my online catalog, sometimes they're really slow, so. Yes, that's, uh, that's exactly how it so works. So this is Cynthia Delago. This is, go ahead, Gene. That's exactly how it works. It's not yeah. normal. Yeah. And, 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 and I'm actually working with a very robust internet system right this, at this point, and I'm still, still slow, so. Uh, I think everyone, okay, let's move on here. Cynthia DeLago, this is Waterworks. I don't know if Cynthia's with us. Um, yeah, I'm here. Hi, Cynthia. Uh, hi. Should we do the full disclosures thing? Oh, absolutely. I know Cynthia. Cynthia is currently a fourth year student at PAFA. Uh, and I have wonderful stories to tell about Cynthia, but I won't go there right now because I don't want to embarrass her. Uh, uh, but I love the work. There were a few other works. Once again, you know, the great thing about these exhibitions is that, you know, you can submit more than one. Uh, people often wonder why the juror happens to pick one over the other. Uh, oftentimes, one might spend you know, 20 minutes going back and forth between the two. This is why it can be a very labor intensive endeavor. Uh, but I know that in this case, I, I, I didn't have to think too long and hard. This was one that immediately jumped out at me. I, I was very enamored of the palette, uh, the sort of, the, the whimsy that, that came with some of the imagery. Uh, so with that, I'd, I'd love to hear Cynthia Talk about the work. Um, well, as you know, Michael, I'm all over the place with my art, yeah. still trying to find my voice. And I go between representational and imaginary um, and abstract. I mean, I can go totally abstract and then totally representational. This falls in between. So um, I don't know. I, I like, I think my method is developing and I think where I'm going is I start with something um, that I can look at, um, like the sponge in this case, and then it just goes from there. It just, you know, other stuff falls into place. Um, and sometimes I get frustrated and just run my fingers through it. And then, and then it just shows another image that I can develop. Um, so that's sort of where this went. Um, and, uh, it just settled down after a little bit of time. So I started with the sponge and I went from there. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was at the shore when I was doing this. So, um, you know, there's more, uh, it was like September. And um, those were the colors that I was um, looking at at the time. Mm -hmm. outside. So they were a direct response in, into what you were actually seeing in the world. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Well, once again, I mean, because I know your work and I know that, um, you know, I'm sympathetic 
to where you are right now uh, in your studio practice because you know you're you're trying lots of different things. Which once again, as you and I have discussed before, we we at least you and I are in agreement that that's a pretty good like luxury to have that you can move between different visual languages and not feel tethered to one or or beholden to one uh, to sort of get to a place. And I, I would agree, this is something of a hybrid piece between those other two worlds, the highly representational and the more non-representational or more abstract. Uh, so I, I think being able to do that, first of all, I, I think must be enjoyable. I, I can relate to it because I, I, I like the freedom of being able to do that. And once again, not everyone needs to do that. But uh, if anyone's out there and they're experiencing something similar where they're working in different visual languages and maybe feeling a little bit you know dicey about it, you should know that you're not alone. Mm -hmm. And that I think the beauty part of art is that we make the rules. Uh, everyone in this room right now, right? Everyone in this Zoom Zoom room is the boss. You make the own. You make your rules for your work. So it's a beautiful piece, and I'm really glad you're in the show. Thank you. I appreciate it. I'm glad you. I'm glad you uh, told me about the show, and I appreciate the hard work everybody put into it to make it work. So thank you. Yeah, yeah, and you know, uh, as I'm moving on, I'll, I'll add. I I emailed Jean when she asked me about maybe getting the word out for the exhibition, and I was a little reticent because I thought, well, I, you know, do we do I let the art community at Path know about it? Because do I want all these like full time mm -hmm. students and grad mm -hmm. students sort of muddying the waters with their submissions, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, mm -hmm. As is normally the case, I overthought that because the, the work in this exhibition is really strong and it's, you know, the caliber of it is really strong. So uh, I was really glad when I saw the submissions because I thought, well, you know, w whatever concerns I had with like ringers who are full time, you know, artists or students muddying the waters was 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 unfounded because that was not the case. This was a very sophisticated piece. Uh, I don't know if the artist is with us. I am. Hi. Okay. So, you know, I, I am a sucker for, you know, organic geometric abstraction. Okay. Uh, you know, the idea that perhaps we're dealing with a form of abstraction that also includes elements of tromploi, you know, those cast shadows. So you, you, you think the forms are flat, but they're also occupying space because they're casting shadows. And then, you know, this sort of skewed Mondrian conversation. So it's like taking a Mondrian and twisting it and turning it. And then, you know, the three primary colors that are weighed and placed in such a way uh, that one has to assume that you know all of the choices in terms of where they are and their size uh, have been you know considered and 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 probably tried out a million times, right? Different choices about where yellow goes, where red go goes, where where does that blue go up there? Uh, exactly. So I, I I was very excited to see the work and once again you had other works in 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 this series but uh i didn't overthink it this was the one that uh, i kept going back to so david would you like to speak on it sure sure i want to say hi to all my fellow artists this is really exciting and a wonderful opportunity to to meet you michael and i'm hoping to get over to see the exhibition it's just a little scary time out there so i haven't decided which way to go at this point but um this painting, I, I call the painting just drifting because at the time I started to think about this particular piece, I was just playing on my computer with an idea to take two or three similar shapes and play with them and reorient their locations and to bisect them with other shapes to create something that felt relaxing to me. It was a day I really just needed to cool, cool down, relax, 
and just drift and let something happen. So this was, as you put it, Michael, um, the product of a lot of different views. And also one other piece that I'd like to mention now, I think would be important, was that I, I had this feeling about my life and its position with respect to what's going on in the world and how to make something new out of something that doesn't exist or just the emotions I had at that moment. And I was thinking, and I'm a new artist. I've been painting about three years. I retired about four years ago. And uh, I've taken a lot of classes and I've read a lot of books and, and I'm learning, but I didn't know how to make grays out of primaries. So mm -hmm. I started to play with that in this painting. And then that became much more meaningful to me because out of these three colors to create something that was completely a surprise to me in how those grays, the tones were, were uh, developing, led me back to this idea that I could take these colors and create something from them that if you looked at those three colors, it's very surprising to at least the non-artist and I think the new artist, how amazing it is to work with these three colors and just create those grays. And then lastly, once I finished with the positioning, then I could see the layering possibilities. And that's where I use the, uh, the, the airbrush to create these layers that made something that looks pretty complex, even more complex. But again, as the, uh, as the author, so to speak, that's what I was feeling that day. I was working on a number of different levels and this helped me kind of communicate that. So there you have it. Very good, very good. I, 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 once again, since I've spent a lot of time looking at works from all different types of, you know, possibilities in terms of, you know, not only the medium, but the visual language, you know, so a sucker for flat abstraction, geometric abstraction, and I know that history well. And then I thought uh, the introduction of the, what I'm calling a trompe l'oeil effect, which is, you know, the, the, the cast shadows that you accomplished with uh, the spray paint or the air gun. Uh, I thought it was, you know, whether you were aware of it, a sort of whimsical take on, on those two possibilities with regard to the history of flat ge uh, geometric abstraction, how it was sort of negating space. And then what you do is you bring space back into the conversation. So uh, it, I, I'm, I'm really excited to hear that this is a, a, a new thing for you. And, uh, you know, I, I'm hoping that if you get to the exhibition, you'll see where I place this uh, because you're on a wall with your people, right? With your tribe, you're, you're on a wall with other geometric abstractionists, okay? So, uh, so, so I hope you get over and I, and I, and I get your reticence uh, because it is scary out there, but you know, pick a day when no one's there. <laughs> And put on the full body glove, and 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 you know when you enter the room, you'll see you'll see the wall that you're on, and you'll see the conversations that are elicited with the groupings that we uh, arrived at. So very good. It. Thanks, Michael. Thanks, David. Yeah, just FYI, no one's beating our doors down. There's only <laughs> a handful of people <laughs> coming in every day. Um, not even. Um, at risk of sounding too authoritarian. We might want to pick up the pace a little bit for each of these pieces. Just to get to everybody. Okay, here we go. Okay, Elisa, uh, wonderful image. I, I, once again, you know, I default oftentimes to imagery that I, I traffic in myself. Uh, um, maybe that's not so good, but it birds and still life motifs. So, you know, I was chuckling to myself. Oh, here's another take on that motif. A wonderful drawing. Uh, a pretty good size drawing. Uh, it really occupies, you know, the wall that it sits on. It's 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 currently showing with other works that have that share a similar uh, palette, actually. Uh, so uh, is Elisa it here? I don't see her on my list. No. Okay. Well, it's a wonderful exhibition. I mean, uh, uh, example of you know this motif of the still life. Uh, in which the still life is sent into a uh, sort of landscape element. Uh, and there's a whole history of that. So I was hoping to share that with Elisa, but we'll move on here. 
because Jean tells me I have to, and I always listen to what Jean says. Ginger, this is a beautiful piece. Uh, it, it's a large piece. Uh, the interesting thing about this piece is that I had no idea how large it was. Uh, I had an inkling of, you know, how it was made via the title. Uh, but I was really surprised when I realized that it was as large as it was. Uh, and it was one of those pieces I thought does an interesting uh, spatial, has an interesting spatial conversation between once again, the, this idea of, a, of flat elements that exist in, in, in you know, the concurrently with these recessional spatial elements. So is Ginger in the house? She's not, no. Okay, uh, it's a beautiful piece. I hope folks get over. I don't know if I have the orientation right, but uh, I think it's a vertical piece though. Yeah, it's vertical. <laughs> okay, all right. So this is a wonderful sculpture. I got a real kick out of this one. Uh, once again, I'm never sure how big works are because I don't look at the, the, the dimensions first. I look at the image and the title. Uh, but this one was really interesting because I noticed that there was more to the image than met the eye. I knew that it was a sculpture, obviously. So, you know, I, I knew that I was only seeing one view of it, but I, I knew that it was complex. I knew that it was pointing in different directions, pardon the pun. Uh, it looked like something that could be moving towards furniture, uh, but also it was soft and it had that softness that was juxtaposed with that hardness that the red lines give it. So uh, is Iva, are you in the house? I don't see her here okay. yet. All right. Well, once again, I hope folks, for the sake of time, can get over and see the piece. It's beautiful and it's placed in context. How about Jane? It looks like she's here, yeah. I'm here. Okay. Hi, Jane. Hi. How are you? I'm fine. It's Thank a beautiful you. piece. Thank it's you. a beautiful piece. And when I tried to place it in a room where it was slightly dark so that the illumination, because the illumination is a big part of the piece. Uh, can you talk about the process? Yes. Um, I was taking a class in paper and illumination. And this was at the end of the class when we were working on our own. And I wanted to do a bowl shape, a vessel shape. And what it is, is there's about three layers of um, kozu, which is um, a very light Japanese paper. I, I didn't make the paper in this instance. I, um, I had it from some source and it, it was just very, very thin. So the process of this is that the bottom there is a ring, a lamp ring. Then on top of that is um, copper, thin copper wire. And the thin copper wire then is embedded into the layers of the uh, paper. And when you do that, and with PV, just PVC glue, and when you do that, then you can bend and twist. Oh, I forgot the important part. Fairy, fairy lights and embedded fairy lights in it um, because the, it was illumination and paper. So when you combine them all, then you can actually manipulate the form any way you want to. And so I manipulated it to be this bowl shape. It does have a ring around the bottom there that sort of shapes it. And I was thinking about clouds and with light coming through the clouds when you look at it. And you can look at it through the sides or from the top down into it. But I was very happy with the way it turned out. <laughs> is, this, is this the first one you've done in this manner? The first, well, it's actually the second piece that I've done in that type of technique. Um, okay. 
this the other one was a suggestion from it was the other one was a suggestion from the teacher about how to do it. This was my own take on what what could happen when you combined all these elements together. Yeah, and, yeah, and I, I like the fact that you uh, you know referred to clouds and how light moves through clouds because then then it's like from a practical standpoint, it's like oh, that's a great way to think about the next piece because maybe the next piece will be informed by the way that, you know, light moves through a forest or something. So I just think it's great that you were able to connect the piece to, you know, uh, an event that can be experienced in, in, in the world, you know, which is once again, a reminder of how great art is because it reminds us not only about the object itself, but how the object points to things in the world and maybe, maybe draws our attention to things in the world that we were probably maybe ignoring, so. Very good. May I ask you a quick question? I went to school with a Joe Mihalik. Oh. Any, any relation? It depends on how the name was spelled. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Anyway, it was a Joe and he was at LaSalle and he was a wonderful person. There was, there is a uh, whole bevy of Mihaliks, I think up in, uh, uh, up around Flower Town. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, he was a. They're, uh, they're not related. To, okay. They don't I, I, have this spelling. They're not related. Okay. <laughs> I, I was clutching at straws here. I was hoping to make that connection, but you know, you never know. Most the great thing about Philadelphia is people stick around. So, uh, very good. Thank you. I'm going Thank forward you. here. I love the piece. I hope you get to see it in the show. Still waiting. Oh, I hope you get over there. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. All right. I don't do a, I don't do any that. photography. Uh, no, no, you froze for a second. Okay. All right. Is, are you seeing it now? No, no, we're seeing it. it. Just when you were talking, you blipped out for a second. Okay. Second. Okay. All right. Uh, yeah, my inter internet connection just sort of went kind of wonky, but I think it's back. So here's an image. It's red. I think I was mentioning that it uh, really, you know, speaks from across the room, as it were, because of that high saturation. And uh, I, since I'm not versed in, in you know, contemporary, you know, uh, Photoshop, Illustrator techniques, I'd love to hear John, if John's in the house, to speak about the work. I think John's here, yeah. I'll ask him to unmute if he wants to. Uh, here I am. Doesn't need to, we can move on. I really like the image. I like the fact that the foreground figure, uh, which is obviously the thing that you perhaps see second because the red is so strong, uh, sort of speaks to that figure way in the distance. Uh, and the textures, uh, once again, uh, you know, what you see is what you think you're seeing, but then you realize, oh, wait a minute, there's all kinds of interesting things happening inside of the walls that mean that maybe there's, this is a, a collage piece with different sources that go into making the final piece, but... Uh, That's what I'm saying. Is that you, John? Uh, can you hear me? Yeah. Oh, well, thanks for your kind words about the piece. I, I did this primarily in Procreate, an app called Procreate. Okay. Um, and I, I this um, town, where was this, the Dominican Republic? Yes. This was in the Dominican Republic. That street, uh -huh. that street actually was red, not as saturated and as red as there, but I did not mm -hmm. turn those buildings in that street into a red, into red. They, it already was red. I did okay. get the sky the way it was. I did yeah. not add the person. I did not add the person way at the end. The small little person that the woman's looking at. Uh -huh. That person was actually walking. That person was walking there. The woman was uh, a figure that I I took a picture of a woman at the New York Art Fair at the um, Jacob Javits Center, maybe a year ago, mm -hmm. who struck me with her stylish clothes, and I've 
I took her, you know, I obviously didn't want to show her face. I took her and I planted her on the street. Yeah, well, it's a very powerful image. Part, you know, obviously the saturation, but uh, certainly that, you know, heightened perspective, you know, where we rush to the, to the background. And, and finally, I, th this is a nice little uh, addition here. I don't, I don't know if you can see my cursor here, but the way that you repeated another facade right. within the facade. Right. right. That's a good move. I like that. Oh, what, thank what, what, you. Well, once again, for, for, for in, in my world, uh, I think complex images that have elements that are in embedded in them that if the viewer is patient enough they are able to discover is it's exactly what this whole thing about looking uh is you know i mean important to me i mean i i enjoy looking so you know i feel rewarded when i light upon an area like that that i know the artist has embedded in the image for me to discover so very good i'm gonna move on thank you because i can tell that gene is wagging that finger at me from I guess home, right, Gene? You're not at Abington, right? Yeah, I'm in my studio at home. Okay. I love this image. It's interesting to see this image after the, the, the previous one because, you know, two examples of extreme perspective being used for, for heightened dramatic effect. Uh, I like the title. Uh, I guess it re ref refers to that structure in the back there. Uh, but is Kathleen with us? Is she? I've got a, I don't think so, no. Okay, it's a wonderful drawing. I think uh, the details are beautiful in it. They, they used to graphite. Uh, so let me move on here. Here we go. Keep an eye on me, Gene. You know how I go. Come on, computer. All right. All right. I don't think I had this title right, but uh, I think I have the name of the artist, right? And still, oh, here we go. It's Laura, yes. Okay, it. am I right here, Laura? Yeah, beautiful piece. I, I love I love the, uh, the materiality of it. It's on this sort of hanging, it's a transparent sort of support. Uh, so there's a translucency to the image that when you get to see it in real time is very effective. Uh, I, I'd, lo I'd love to hear from Laura if she's in the house here. And I think she has a different title for the piece. That was just the name of the image. She, she did, and that's, and that's what I was saying before I got cut out. So I don't have the title right. So is, is Laura with us? Hi, yeah, I'm here. Can, can you, uh, my apologies for the title. Can you clarify what the title really is? Um, that is the title. It is, okay. Yeah, I did have another, I did have another name. They're both in Danish because this is, okay. um, this was from uh, a sculpture in a church in Denmark. And I, God, I can't remember the name. I thought I had a different painting in the show. Otherwise I would have been prepared, sorry. Um, okay. Anyway, <laughs> I think one of, I think one of the titles means guardian savior. And the mm -hmm. other one means high breasts. Yeah. <laughs> because, because her breasts are like up on her collarbones. Uh -huh. um, anyway, I just thought this was uh, such um, an erotic piece to have in a, in a church. And um, it just struck me funny, but there's, there's all kinds of little uh, images floating around in the background too. Mm-hmm. So, so the image, the image in the church is explicit like this, would you say? Yeah, this is pretty much exactly what it looks like. Okay, that's really interesting, you know, because I spend a lot of time in Bulgaria and I, I love going and looking at the churches and the icons in the church uh, and, and oftentimes take inspiration from them. Uh, so, you know, once again, you're doing something similar here and it's fascinating to find out that, you know, that this image could be close to its original source because we would never find that in an Eastern Orthodox church. So uh, wonderful piece. You have a series of these, I assume, right? Works based on uh, this source material? Um, no, no, I did actually, the, the 
piece I had in the last show at Abington over the summer was was based on a on a similar sculpture of the pregnant virgin that's in from Evora uh, in Spain. Okay. Um, so I'm finding a connection there. They, they, these are, in this case, a painting based on a source material that happens to be some kind of votive mater source material, right? Something you'll see in a church, uh, be it two-dimensional or three-dimensional. Yeah. Okay. Right. So. Well, it's wonderful. I hope you get to see it where it's arranged because it's placed next to some other interesting work uh, that once again, uh, helps to expand I think a conversation. Uh, are we seeing Lauren's work? Yep. Very good. Maybe the internet's coming back. Uh, once again, this is on a wall of uh, uh, geometric abstractions primarily. So there's a really interesting conversation in the exhibition about this particular area of uh, visual language. Uh, and this piece I think comes with uh, an additional element which is an audio element. Uh, and I'm not sure if Lauren is in the house. Yep, she's here. Okay. I'm here. Uh, Lauren, would you like to? Hi. <laughs> so you're a conceptual artist, whether you know it or not. I guess so. <laughs> I guess so. And, and once again, there are other conceptual artists, uh, some more so than others. Uh, you meant this piece to be seen in conjunction with an audio element, correct? Yes, yes. Can you, can you can you explain that to the to the crew here? Sure. So um, the piece basically is supposed to be both a music composition and also an artwork. And when creating the piece, I strive to have both elements represented pretty equally. So the score it's the the score is the painting and the painting is also the music. So in order to perform the painting, basically a set of two to five performers are to each pick a line and they can play that line as many times as they want before going on to a new line. Um, and the you know instructions for performance are displayed alongside the paintings, thank you. Um, but basically it was determined um, like the colors versus the pitches used in the piece are determined by the frequency at which we are able to view different colors and light as well as the frequency of the pitches themselves so for example the uh 440 hertz is the note a4 which is important for you know usually tuning instruments and if you compare 440 hertz to 440 terahertz, which is how we measure light frequency, you're going to get the color red. So I used the pitches to dictate the colors, except at the same time, I wanted to use a color palette that was also representative of the overall harmony used when writing the piece itself. So it's uh, a play on both of them and in turn trying to create a piece that can be both art and music and is supposed to blur the line between um, what separates art and music. Okay, that's some pretty heavy stuff. Uh, uh, two quick questions and, and we could be talking for hours and we can't, if we, we don't have the time. Uh, what comes first, the score or the images? <laughs> it, it's kind of like a, a chicken and egg question, okay. I feel like. So this is going to be a part of a larger series of um, artworks that kind of use a similar process. With this one, um, the, the painting and the composition kind of grew alongside each other pretty well, I think. Um, in some ways, I feel like this almost leans more towards being a music composition than an artwork, just because it's so heavily grounded in the actual process of playing the composition. Um, so I guess this one is more composition lenient. However, I am working on other pieces where the composition is almost entirely derived from the starting point of art. So I think that it's exciting to be able to follow both channels of art and music um, because there are so many options and so many ways to explore that combination. Yeah, yeah. great. I, 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 one last question. Are, are you aware of other artists that are you know, mining this territory? Um, I 
I've seen a couple artists. I actually recently came across another artist in the Philadelphia region who is doing something kind of similar where she was taking sound bites and then using them in woven textile format. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think that there are other artists trying, artists and musicians who are interested in that kind of combination. Yeah. Are, are you familiar with Brian Eno? Yes. <laughs> All right, well, we'll leave it at that. I thought of him when I saw this and I'm really happy that you're out there doing this. And that, you. and that you know, I hope you get a venue where you can do a solo show and, and, and have all the bells and whistles because you, you should. <laughs> Thank you so much, I appreciate that. So welcome, let's keep going here. If I can jump in real quick, Michael, um, there's a lot of interesting conversations and comments going on in the chat. Normally I'd read them all, but for the sake of time, you can open up the chat and read them yourself. Um, yeah. Thank you everyone for interacting. <laughs> well, let me ask you this, Gene, as we keep moving and I'll, I'm gonna pick up the pace. Uh, do you save this and archive it and people can go back and look at it? Yeah, so just to let everybody know is that we always upload our video to YouTube um and we let everybody know about it on facebook and stuff like that so you can always view this later yeah okay well i'm gonna pick up the pace i love this piece liz uh i don't know if you're in the house here but uh you know the physicality of the work i knew that it would be interesting uh even though i was only seeing the image on a screen when we were first looking at it i love the fact that the uh landscape as it were sort of you know opens up to all kinds of possible interpretations. And we see this in other work in the exhibition where it, it skirts that element of between representation and abstraction. So the goat obviously is the main motif, but then the environment or the landscape that the goat occupies starts to slip and then reference possible other things. So uh, yeah, it's a, it's, a, it's a fun, whimsical piece. And I, and I immediately responded to it. Uh, Liz, are you here? Thank you. Yes, I am. I appreciate that. Thanks. Hi, Liz. I, I think I've seen your work before. I don't know. Yes. Yeah, I'm a giant fan of yours. And I, I came to a show you put together at Cerulean Gallery with James Havard. Oh, yes. That's where that's where I knew your name. And yeah. So you kind of see here, too. This is like, I really loved his stuff. And I, you know, definitely am feeling influenced by that. Yeah. Um, and I also just really like um i don't know like open space a sense of you know not too much going on and there being a little place to rest you know when looking at things so that's yeah. It. yeah and 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 liz the the frame is fine oh i just like i would have rather it be uh lighter colored i didn't want to put yeah. it in a black frame but that's what i had it it works fine i just wanted to keep you know <laughs> I, I know that you were thinking of switching it but i I, I, you know, it, I think it works great, but I, I really, I love the whimsy of it. And uh, yes, we talked about James Havard and, and, uh, and, and, well, I could see the, I could see that once again, you're, uh, I think of that tribe, you would have fit nicely in that exhibition. Thanks. Yeah. Okay. I hope you get to see the show. Oh, I would really like to. Definitely. Yeah. It's fantastic. All right. If there's time at the end, I have a couple of interior pictures of the show. Yeah. I would love to see those. I'm going to really try to pick it up. I love this painting. I love the, uh, you know, the saturated colors, you know, the intelligent choice of the compliments. And, 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 and I love the reflection of the shadow of the net. Uh, what's not to like about this painting, right? Uh, the the aerial view of the tabletop still life motif, all the the you know circular repeated shapes, geometric shapes, uh, and, and once again, I, I think I couldn't stop thinking about how important and how much fun it was to look at you know the the the, the shadow element in the work and how the shadows are a major part of this piece. So I'm not sure if Maria is here. She's not here today. No. Okay. All right, it's a nice piece. Come on. I got a uh, hang in there, folks. My computer is going to sleep, I think. There we go. Should have let you do this. I should have shared this from your end, Gene. You probably have 
a more robust computer than I have. All I'm right, also Marcus is here. Rural area, so okay. no one's leeching my internet. <laughs> <laughs> Are we seeing Mark's work? Yes. Okay, so once again, if I had a bigger boat, uh, there were two works in this uh, by this artist who, uh, and I would have loved to have included both of them. I had to make the hard decision uh, about her. Uh, I think the other piece. Correct me if I'm wrong, Mark. I see you're here. Was it was it him? Uh, no, actually, this piece is called her rolling pin. Okay, so hang on. My my computer just jumped to William's work, so I got to go back here. Okay, so I don't have the the full title, right? Correct. Okay. That's okay. You have the image, though. If you can go back to the image, that would be great. Yeah, I'm trying. I, I clicked the little arrow, so we're just going to have to wait. You have to bear with us. Uh, I don't know how many of you have been doing Zooms, but they are fraught with all kinds of gremlins. But I think we're back to your image. Yep. Yeah. And, uh, you know, once again, I don't need all kinds of backstories to, in, to appreciate works of art. Uh, I, I appreciate backstories, but I, I love the way that, you know, I'm able to construct a narrative. Once again, I have the title wrong. It's her, her rolling pin, correct? Yes. Yeah, it's a, it's a beautiful piece. I love, you know, the double use of glass. I love the enigmatic ladder, you know, floating above, you know, the image of the house house being domicile, a uh, rolling pin, obviously, you know, a functional tool to make things that, you know, we relate to with regard to nurturing and caring. Uh, so I'll, I'm going to let you comment, Mark. Do you want to have? Sure, sure. Yeah, this is um, one example from um, the largest um, series that I've ever worked on in my life. Um, I started it three years ago at Wheaton Arts. Um, I got a fellowship down there. It was my second fellowship. I had one 20 years ago. And I had this idea that I wanted to share people's memories through objects. It's not a weapon. It was never a weapon. And so I, I worked, I planned for um, almost a year before the project actually got going. And Wheaton Arts allowed me the opportunity to work during the Festival of Fine Arts weekend in early October where they had about 10 to 12,000 people showed up. And I had a box that I'd made and I had index cards and marking tools and people would write or draw a picture of something, a memory from their past. It could be just about anything. And they would put these in the slot, sort of like a ballot box. And then I and my team would take these cards out and whether or not somebody was going to bring the actual object like an Air Force pilot who was up in age brought his wings, this tiny little set of wings, um, various things that I could either push in the sand. So the rolling pin is sand cast. Mm -hmm. um, and then I would, with my team, who are all former students that I went on to Bard and RISD and all over the place, Tyler um, would help me. They'd gather on the weekends because I teach full time at a local high school. So I'd get in my truck on Friday afternoon, drive an hour and a half down to Millville, New Jersey, mix sand for about four hours. My team would show up. We'd pour a glass and mix sand all Saturday and most of Sunday. We usually poured about 900 pounds of glass. So we created hundreds of objects in the sand casting, knowing I would have these in my warehouse to later on use to become more complete sculptures. Um, and they're very, they vary quite a bit. Um, I also had people send me images of houses they grew up on, grew up in. And I also went and took lots of photographs of houses, suburban houses, you know, kind of 50s, 60s. And I learned how to make silk screen on glass. And these are fired. Some I use powder print, which is a really cool technique. So you actually have an embossed image when they're fired, it sticks up. And so, I silk screen on the glass, I fire it, I cut, I polish, I do whatever I have to do. I create these little scenes, often with wood or other materials. So this piece, uh, when the, 
person submitted, she did a beautiful little drawing on, on the index card of a rolling pin. And she said, the rolling pin that my mother rolled out German apple strudel dough. And I just loved that, you know, and I love all the stories that I'd gathered. Um, I, there, are, there are hundreds of stories and they're on cards and I've been processing these now and creating these pieces with them. And it's just sort of, you know, sometimes like this rolling pin was my rolling pin. I didn't need her rolling pin. Some people actually bought the real objects and we pushed them into sand. I mean, we had things from bear skulls found in Yosemite to, and like I said, even the pilot's uh, wings, which technically it was the thickness of a quarter. And to, I looked at that, he showed up, his wife showed up and his daughter showed up that weekend. And they're like, can you cast these? And I looked at my, one of my top mold makers and I said, we can do anything. Mm -hmm. And the impression is so subtle. This is sand. Yeah. Okay, like go to the beach and push something in sand. You know how rough it is? And it was just incredible that we got an impression. What we do is we, we line the molds, they're sand molds. We line them with graphite and alcohol that's sprayed and then later burnt to burn off the alcohol. And then we ladle the hot glass in. Then these pieces are put into a cooling oven called an annealing oven at 950 and they're cooled over a few days. I've been working with hot glass for 40 years. It's been my material of choice, but I also like working other aspects of the glass. I hope that you guys um, can visit my Instagram site. If you wanna see this project, it's called Memory Object 2019. I can put it in the chat. Um, if you wanna really see the rest of the pieces and how it's happening, um, even there's some films of us casting it's really, really exciting. Um, this project has just meant so much to me. Yes, thank you, Marsh. Um, really great. It's great. It's great. I, I hope that everyone gets to see this piece in particular, but certainly uh, the other works uh, in, in the series. Very strong. You need to have this exhibition, right? You need a retrospective. Absolutely. Mark. Yes, it's growing. Let me tell you, I've got a lot of objects. You need to find a big space and have a big show. So good luck with that. Thank you very much. Strong. I, I love the piece. William, is William in the house? William Timmons. Right, William. Yeah, I'm here. Hi, Michael. I'll, I'll quickly, uh, you know, the abstract imagery that just, just points to possibilities regarding read abilities. Uh, each one of these shapes can be read into in terms of some kind of association. So uh, uh, I, I hope that William gets to see the show and gets to see the work that, the sh that it is next to. Stephen Hopkins, I don't know if this is the right title. Hey, uh, Michael, Michael. Yes. This is, this is Bill, William. Hi. The title, Hi. the title of my piece is actually White with a History. That's right, and I'm sorry about that. Uh, you know, I, I, I used this, this presentation just to make the choices, and then I didn't have time to go back and, and clean it up. So do you want to speak about this piece, William? Real quickly. Yeah, yeah. no, just thir 30 seconds. Uh, what it was initially is you'll see there's just a lot of shapes, a lot of colors. I actually started a canvas, and it was saturated with color and shapes. And when I got done, it was just getting on my nerves. <laughs> um, so I let it sit for you know, a couple months. And then at some point I figured, well, I got to do something with this. And I've done this before. I actually went in and uh, mixed up uh, some different shades of white oil paint and um, just started editing, looked at the piece and tried to figure out... Um, you know, what parts of the painting did I think were, you know, provided maybe an interesting narrative. Um, and, uh, you know, took it from there. It was a little bit, you know, I get a little bit nervous when I'm editing, you know, did I edit the right stuff out, leave the right stuff in. But um, in essence, you know, that's where it, I came up with the title White with the History. White with the um, History, yeah. No, it's, it's, a, I, I love it. I'm a sucker for this kind of abstraction, by the way. So, I mean, I'm laying my cards on the table right now. Uh, and I think it's interesting for everyone in the room to hear about how you arrived at this final piece, which was an older piece that you weren't happy with. And then you basically, you know, efface or cover huge 
bits of the real estate to arrive at this completely different, you know, image. Yeah. So. yeah, I was much, much happier with this. One yeah. person mentioned to me, and I, I'll be done after this, is that they actually said it reminded them of totem images, which uh -huh. I thought was interesting. Well, I, I think the great thing about degrees of abstraction is that, the, you know, everyone can bring their own associations to them, you know? Exactly. Uh, and, and I also think knowing the history of it, one can go back and sort of think about, well, what was that, you know, what was that cross with the yellow shape? Oh, that must have been a window with a moon or a sun, mm -hmm. right? And you can go back and deconstruct the piece. So, stuff. Great. Thanks, Michael. Yeah, and I, I'm sorry if I'm if I'm moving through things too quickly right now. No, no, I understand. But I got Gene, and Gene, Gene's the boss, by the way. I don't know if anybody knows Gene, but you know, Gene, iron fist in a velvet glove. Gene, Gene, <laughs> he, he takes he takes no mess when it comes to staying on track here. And and, right. and truth be told, I I clicked the little arrow. And I'm still waiting for the magic. So everyone needs to, I mean, they, be patient. I'm doing. Thank you, Michael. Thank you, Gene. <laughs> the best thank you all. And thank you everyone for being patient. Yeah. All right, I'm gonna click it again and hope that it moves forward. All right, so now I'm at Steven. And is Steven here? I'm here. Yes, I'm here. Hi, Hi, Stephen. Hi. Yeah, good. Why don't I just let you talk about work? Because uh, uh, you had three other images. I think they were all uh, very post-apocalyptic. It makes complete sense that you made this image, I'm assuming, recently. So I'm going to let you talk about it. Uh, yes, uh, it's a series of about 20. And um, I, I think really when I look at it now, it just clearly shows my um, upbringing, my parents letting me watch any old violent cartoon on television when I was <laughs> in the late 70s and 80s. And I guess um, to, for me, I just harken back to the, those, those uh, cartoons of the 20s and 30s that were really adult focused. But when you were in the 70s and the 80s, the kids were watching these cartoons and just, um, just absorbing all of this. And I guess with everything that was going on this year, uh, come August, uh, July, August, I just got into this whole series. And um, I guess I'm processing something right now that, uh, you know, It'll reveal itself at one point, but um, they were just really fun to make. Yeah, yeah. What's the, and I have the title wrong, don't I? Uh, the title on this one is "Bombs Away." Okay, yeah, that's what I thought. I'm sorry about that. Apologize to everyone, uh, but it, I hope you see the show because it's placed in a very sort of humorous way, uh, and I'm not going to give that away. So this <laughs> is Cheryl Kessler. This is not the title of the piece, uh, and once again, in full disclosure, I know Cheryl because Cheryl works at Path. Uh, and I was really happy to see this piece. And Cheryl, do you want to say something about it? Um, yeah, I I guess probably in the group, um, m the person who is probably sees herself as more of a designer than an artist. Um, I just like to make pretty things. I don't usually have any um, message within. Um, I started playing around with transparent fabric. This is embroidered. Um, there's upcycled shirting in the back and um, little pieces. A friend of mine is a uh, prolific fiber person. And uh, right now, she, uh, for the last few years, she's been a prolific quilter and I get all of her scraps. So it's mostly scraps. And um, I just like playing with, sometimes um, I don't play with the design of the fabric at all, but other times I like to play on the print in the fabric. So it's just some different embroidery stitches. And um, actually I liked the one of the other pieces I submitted better. <laughs> I was surprised you chose this one. Yeah, yeah, but you, you know, Cheryl, when it comes to this kind of stuff, I'm the boss. <laughs> Uh, and, and obviously the other pieces were very strong also. I, I, and I made a decision that once again, uh, I'm looking at this as an artist. You're an artist who designs and you know we won't get into the semantic weeds here. Uh, this is most obviously a tabletop still life in which the vase <laughs> has not been able to control the floral motif. The flowers 
are asserting their independence. They've moved on to the table. They're moving out of the vase. So there's so all kinds of- You gave me an idea for new work, so thank well, you. I hope you can see that. Right, I can see it now. <laughs> as, as as a pot, well, I'm a professional, Cheryl. Uh, <laughs> I, I I think the whole idea of an artist and a designer, artists make images, they have content. Uh, maybe the content is something that is something that they arrive at later. So very good piece, Cheryl. Thank you. And it's good to see you. And thanks for for accepting it into the show. Are you kidding me? Of course. <laughs> So I, I, I don't have I don't have the title of this either. I don't know if Scott is with us. I believe it's called Motions of Fun, and okay. I do not see that Scott is here. Anymore. All right, all right. So I, I hope everyone gets to see this exhibition because this piece is it's hung over the mantle piece in the in in one of the main rooms, and it sort of points the viewer not only into the exhibition, I thought the exhibition was entering through a different door, but uh, it's a wonderful piece. Uh, this is a very curious artist. There's all kinds of interesting content here that can be read into this piece. Uh, and it seems to be, once again, very much a commentary on, on, on current conversations that are happening in our society regarding all kinds of interesting and difficult conversations regarding gender. So I'm going to, Keep moving through this. It's a wonderful piece, but we're pressed for time. Thanks for that title, Jean. I just clicked the arrow. I'm waiting for the magic to happen here. Um, and I know that I have other windows open, which is probably causing this trouble, but I can't get to them right now. So bear with us here. How are we doing on time, Jean? Oh, geez. A little short on time. We're about halfway through. Halfway through the presentations, huh? Yeah, Not we're halfway good. through the presentation. We have about 30 Not minutes good. left. So I think what we're going to have to do is I'm going to have to give everyone 60 seconds to talk about their work. If we want to get to everybody, if someone's not okay. here, we'll just have to move on. Okay. So is Sarah here? I do not see her, no. Okay, it's a beautiful piece. Very moving. Yes, I Sarah's see here. Uh, Sarah's here. Sarah, you gave us the wrong piece. <laughs> what do you mean I gave you the wrong piece? We, we have the one of uh, the Tate, her sitting at the kitchen table. Oh, that's right. What? No, I okay. gave you two and you chose the one at the kitchen table. Uh, and this is okay. a different one. <laughs> well, 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 I'm, hoping, I'm hoping that the image stays. I clicked on some arrows. Uh, Sarah, talk about this piece. Well, uh, there's a series of photos I was doing um, on what it was like to be alone in this in this uh, time, and the one at the dining room table, me alone, showed what it was like to be with without family and without um, company, and it it and and they got to be self portraits, which kind of surprised me and then scared the hell out of me if you really want to know and um so it's it's ongoing um Did you get burned and it's hard to figure out sort of what yeah what talk about this one this one uh actually it's an i i got the idea for this from joel meyerwitz doing self portraits in his house and so early in the morning uh, sitting on the bed, looking out the window, um, kind of the idea of being stuck alone, looking out for something, anything, please. <laughs> um, and behind it is a is a is a photograph uh, of a performance of the um, uh, dancer Aiko. Uh, taken at 30th Street Station, and the heads happen to work really well together. Yeah, My head, his head, the, back, the, the space in between. That's great. And um, yeah. All right. So, Thank yeah. you. I have a yeah. someone's asking what medium it is, and it is a photograph. It's a photograph, right. All right. Thank yeah, you. I, I, love, I love that the head, I love the way that they played off one another. That was serendipitous, I believe. 
Yeah, it was. Yeah. It's Sabina here. I think her name is misspelled too. It's Sabrina. And I don't see her here. Sabrina, are you here? No. Okay. All right. Beautiful painting. I love the uh the the sort of somber nature of the of the subject matter, uh the sort of authority that the young figure has. And then the the the, the painting technique is beautiful, very transparent. So let me keep moving here, I'm trying to make up for lost time, which I, I'm sure I screwed this one up too. Maybe. No, that's correct. Okay. So it's the artist in the house. Well, it's a beautiful painting. It's very, it's got a lot of thick opaque paint and then some translucent and then more fluid paint. It's a wonderful composition. Uh, and it's placed next to other work that once again, it seems to be very sympathetic with, right? The figure in isolation, uh, like some of the previous images we've looked at here. So uh, this is a wonderful big painting uh, that has a collage element to it because I think lots of fabric going on. Uh, is Anna here? No, she couldn't make it today. Okay, well, once again, it's a large piece it's very complex. Uh, it's placed right next to another image that we'll get to shortly, and they have a really interesting conversation with one another. Uh, did I get the name Bates correct? Yes. I think I did. You did, yeah. Bates in the house? Bates is in the house, and I can tell Hello. You. Go ahead. So yeah. let's talk about the work. It's a beautiful piece. It's very complex. Uh, it looks as if it's been uh composed on a computer but i'm not sure it, it has been um i'm trying to be a printmaker silk screener but all my studios and classes have closed down so i went back to digital print uh the figure um i need content so i've been looking at different websites where they have artist models doing yeah. various poses and i drew this pose uh freehand and then i scanned it in uh, checked it with the image, uh, put it in Painter, which is a program I use and worked on it. Um, and then I needed a composition. I, I look at a lot of other people's work and there were some, there was an image of a, a totally different female figure next to a blue pole. So I like that, I use that. And speaking of James Havard, the bottom part of the uh, work is really influenced by him and one of his works, the gray and the black, and he had a ladder in it, and I put a ladder in mine, and then various things, various fills from um, painter and images that I did of my own, and an image from one of my other silk screens, and worked on it, moved things around, and that, that's this is what it is. So okay, yeah, very strong. Thank you very much, Bates. Thank you for picking it. Oh, it was my pleasure. Once again, I clicked on the little arrow. Be patient with us, folks. I'm reticent to click it again, but I'm going to. Look dangerously, Gene. I'm out on a limb here, Gene. All right. I trust you. <laughs> okay. Looks like we got Michael a little frozen. Michael, are you there? I'm here. You got to pay your internet I'm bill. Working at, <laughs> um, I got great in BIOS and they're top of the, the line. You know what it is? I made the images large so that we could see them well. And I think it's just a, uh, uh, hang on here. I don't know, Gene. I got the little spinny wheel going. Can you even hear me? I can hear you. All right. You know, I, I do have, I have this old presentation on here. If you want to yes. switch to, be able to. Oh, you okay. got it though. Why don't you, why don't you bring yours up, bring yours up in the meantime. Okay. Maybe I'll have you share the rest of them because now I just triple clicked here and let's do this. Let's see. 
if we can stay on this image, is Cheryl. I guess that's a no. Well, once again, I was happy that we had a range. Uh, I, I, this is a very reductive image. And yet at the same time, uh, it's chock full of information. So uh, I, I, I was happy that it was in the show. It offered up uh, a, a range to the show. Can you still hear me, Jean? Yes. Good, okay. Uh, I'm What's the medium of this? Reticent to go backwards and that, what is the medium? This is a drawing, I believe. This is on paper. I think it's ink on paper. Am I right, Jean? I believe that's correct. Okay. I'd have to check my um yeah. spreadsheet. Okay. I'm gonna click. In the meantime, you should fire up your presentation there. Danielle in the house. Danielle, I do not see okay. Danielle. Anyway, I hope folks get to see it. This is a big painting. This is like four by six feet. Uh, once again, it was another one of the works that was obviously in response to our current climate situation, both political and medical. Uh, what a summer, right? Uh, this is a very indicative piece of a slice of the summer, or I should say maybe more than a slice, perhaps a big chunk, uh, but it's a beautiful piece. And it's really well made. And I'm happy that we were able to accommodate it because it's a, it's a large piece. So Jean, let me know when you're ready to share because I'm clicking. I can go ahead and share now. Okay, so I'm gonna stop sharing. Okay. okay. Sounds good. I'm pushing stop share now. And 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 if if you can get us to where I'm leaving off here. And then I I I I I had to there was one that I missed, and it was the watercolor of the backyard tree. So, all right, I'm closing stuff here. Okay, everyone can see? Then you're gonna share. And we're gonna get through this. Then we're gonna go shopping. <laughs> Christmas shopping. We're gonna, right, go, we're gonna talk at me. Can you guys see um, Dave's piece? Yeah. Okay. Now, Jean, can you go? Can you go back to? All right. Whose piece are you looking for? Two back. It's what? the watercolor of the tree. Yeah. All right. Let's because I I I we I jumped over that. Mm -hmm. Okay, Carmela. Carmela here. Well, anyway, it's a beautiful piece. I love it. It's really well made. Uh, it, it, it does what I was mentioning earlier. It offers up all kinds of compelling uh, imagery and information. Every square inch of this painting uh, rewards, you know, deep looking. And, uh, you know, it, it reminded me of, you know, that motif that we see in the city. I live in the city of, you know, shoes hanging from, you know, clotheslines or telephone lines, and then to see it in a suburban environment, I thought was uh, an interesting take on that. That uh, that cultural event, which is urban, you know, sneakers, sneakers in 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 in, in uh, telephone lines. So, but if Carmela's not here, we can move on, Jean. Okay. Okay, Dave. Is Dave here? Mm -hmm. No, I guess not. Well, oh, hang on, hang on. All right, so I'll, I'll, I got I got a little mixed up there. My computer's trying to close all those windows. So, uh, Dave's not here. I love this photograph. It's very, uh, it's it's very unusual. I I I. I it, when I look at an object or an image and I, and I, and I have to slow down and think about how it was made, uh, I'm, 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 I'm all in. Uh, there's an interesting idea of reflections here. What am I seeing? Uh, this illuminated structure, uh, the recurring motif of the house, that was, that's another sub motif in this exhibition was in play. So I knew I wanted to include it to sort of 
once again have a, a sub motif regarding uh, this conversation about structures and or domicile or house and then you know the the, the bare bones of that uh, structure. Uh, so let's move on, Gene, if we can. Okay, Ellen, is Ellen here? And the title is not okay. complete. Hi, Ellen. Hi. This is it's called. It's called Lessons in Glamour. Yeah, Lessons in Glamour. That's what it, it is. is. Yeah. You want me to speak? Yes, please. Okay. It's a long-term 20-year series that I've been working on. Started in film and then graduated to um, digital with um, the back room of drag queens. Most of them are my friends. And it was to show and identify who they are and drag kings prior to when they come out on stage. So I actually have an entire series of them. And this is just one of them. This is Phoebe. That's her um, stage name. I just want to let everyone know Ellen is actually having a solo exhibition with us. Uh, when? When? After this exhibition. Very nice. Very nice. Uh, Ellen, why did you choose this one of the whole series? Um, I, you know what? I, I happen to love it. It uh, speaks to me, and in um, and it, to be perfectly honest, it was one of the ones that was framed. <laughs> so since I am limited on getting my work framed and printed um, on time because of everything closing down, um, that was why I chose this one. I actually, my show is not on my drag queens. My show is on my um, Mardi Gras portraits. But I chose this one. I happen to love it. I have many that I love, um, but I chose this in particular. Okay. Well, I'm always curious about why artists, particularly when they have a series, right? And if you had, let's say one had 30 images within the series, I'm always curious about why artists choose the ones that they do. Um, there's certain ones that speak to me. And um, I think that we, um, we sh although we shouldn't fall in love with our work, we often do. And there are certain individuals that I have photographed for 20 years. So I, they're my friends and I identify with them. So I'm sure that that has to do with a lot of it, of why yeah. I choose them. Yeah. And a series is tough. I have about 60 pieces of this. So it's a, you're, I, you're absolutely correct. It's yeah. difficult. Yeah, it is, and I and once again, I, I think it's I I think I heard you say that we shouldn't fall in love with our work. Well, we should fall in love with our we should not fall in love with our work necessarily to the point where we exclude other pieces of work that might be able to demonstrate what we're trying to say. Sometimes we're so personally involved in the work that it's difficult to see um, the art for art's sake, and it doesn't. It might speak to us in a manner that only speaks to us, but the purpose is that we want to, we, for, as a photographer and doing this kind of work, I want to create a reaction from other people. I want them to feel the same things that I felt in it. Yeah, so I, I get that. It's one of the things that we talk about in school a lot, which is the ability to develop a, a, as objective an eye as one can. So I, I get exactly what you're saying. So very strong. Thank you, Ellen. Thank you. All right, here we go, Jean. This is another one of those pieces, and I'll just dive right in here, that I, I, I was thinking about in reference to some of the other works that were included. Uh, they were abstract works, in this case, abstract works on paper uh, that had a kind of reductive language to it, uh, and at the same time was pointing towards reference materials that could source, you know, a subject matter that could be, you know, seen and, and articulated in this case, butterflies. So is, is Hermine with us? Yes, um, can you, can you hear me? We hear you. Oh, good. <laughs> Say a few words about this, please. Okay, um, actually, um, I work in pattern and I do that because um, my father was in uh, interior design mm -hmm. and uh, I looked through a lot of pattern uh, books when I was a kid 
and even uh, all my life I was looking into uh, at pattern books. Um, I studied architecture and so I use um, things, um, I use mylar, I draw on mylar and I like to use um, uh, uh, graphite pencils um, because I decided that I wanted to use the simplest materials uh, and see what I could do uh, with just the mylar and the uh, pencils uh, and, and see what I could create with the pattern. But when I make pattern, I don't want it to, um, I make the pattern um, disintegrate and turn into other patterns. Uh, and, I, and I also try to make it um, balance it out with, uh, uh, I like to use texture in it too. And the way I make my line is very important. The way I um, apply the line is important to me. Uh, and so, all those things I try to bring together to uh, make something that actually makes sense, mm -hmm. and uh, and and is interesting to look at. And it's small because uh, since I've gotten older, I can't make large things, and uh, I can only carry uh, smaller works now. Uh, so it, that even makes things a little bit um, more uh, condensed uh, and and. Uh, when I work, it's very uh, um, time, uh, what do you call it? Uh, and, and, uh, it's intense to, to draw all the drawings that I make. Uh, but I, I really, you know, I, I, I find that um, it's, it's, um, it's sort of cerebral. <laughs> yeah, and it's meditative, I'm sure, making a work like this. It is Not always. Uh, yeah. Sometimes it's kind of like, oh my God, it's angsty sometimes because what's behind uh, is also as much as important as the pattern is what's behind the pattern and you keep uh, where you where you place things and you have to make that the marks are actually talking to one another yeah. so that can be sort of nerve-wracking a little bit but um, when you're making it you have to be present all, at all times yeah when you're making that mark you have to be present with your hands and how you're making the mark and you know the way that you feel during the time that you're making the mark uh, also makes the marks different. Yeah, well, all, all the more reason why we have to see the work in the flesh. So, you know, once again, to the folks who can, I hope I hope you get there. Uh, is James with us? Thank you for picking my work. Oh, are you kidding me? I love it. Oh, thank you very much. I love it. Thank you so much, Michael. You're so welcome. It's a pleasure. <laughs> I don't know if James is with us. Yes, I'm here, Michael. Hi, James. And I don't know, did I mangle the uh, the title? Actually, yes. Okay. <laughs> and it's actually called uh, 30th Century Landscape. Okay, yeah. And I apologize. And uh, uh, okay. nevertheless, why don't you dive right in? Talk, talk about your process and, and uh, your imagery. Well, my process is... Uh, I, I plan nothing. I, I just start grabbing pieces of paper that I've piled up around here and I start moving things around and um, I don't have any intention except to create something visually interesting. Mm -hmm. um, uh, lately, things have been very architectural and blocky and I bounce between an, images like that and more flat images. Um, the title comes from, after this was finished, um, it reminded me of being a, a boy who loved comic books. And uh, I used to mimic these landscapes of a 30th century <laughs> comic book and it reminded me of, uh, this piece reminded me of that. And that's why I titled it that. Yeah, no, I love it. You had three images. They were all strong. Uh, Thank you. I had a hard decision, a hard time. Uh, but yeah, I got, I got the, uh, the, the urban cityscape th uh, read immediately. I, I got, you know, the different spaces that are occurring simultaneously. So I slipped into my cubist mode. Uh, I thought about Kurt Schwitters and just, you know, the beauty of collage yes. and, and how you can pack uh, a powerful punch uh, with very small objects, because this is a relatively humble. Most of my pieces have been very small. And, yeah. Uh, yeah. And, uh, and once again, it, 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 in, in the exhibition, it, it, you know, it, it holds the wall because 
uh, because you pack it with all this wonderful, beautiful information. Uh, so I, I'm, I'm so happy to see it. Thank you for accepting it. Oh, my, once again, it, it, it's great. I could go on and on about it, but we don't have time. Is this, this is called uh, Trampled Underfoot. Is, is, and this is I'm a here. piece. Are you here? Yep, I'm here. Yeah, so very, very nice. Is, is it named after the uh, Led Zeppelin tune? <laughs> no, that is no. a good song, though. Okay, all right. I actually, so, had never even thought about that. <laughs> never even thought about that. So, no. anyway, it's we. Funny, found, I'm a big Zeppelin fan. <laughs> we, we found a better. We found a better uh, uh, pedestal for it. So. Yeah, that's good. That one was a bit wobbly. It's it's wonderfully placed. You, uh, I'm gonna let you take take it away. Um, so this was part of a three-part series that are all kind of these like faces undergoing trials. Uh, I'm not going to talk too much about the other ones. If you want to see it, it's uh, you can see my website, sinisisculpture.com. But they all, I started them before COVID, but COVID definitely gave me time to finish them and go through them all. So I've been kind of working on that. Uh, this piece is all, it's marble and then a piece of concrete underneath. And I actually got the piece of concrete in a park. So there's a family somewhere in a park who got to see some crazy guy dragging a piece of concrete out of the, out of the park and throwing it in his truck. But, yeah. No, I, I love it. It's, it's, a, it's, it's really well made. Uh, it's got a sense of humor. And then at the same time, you know, obviously there's some the ava availability of serious content here. And uh, it's hard not to read things through the current climate that we are in. So. Um, and I'm sure that you are, you, you welcome that read. Yeah. yeah. Thanks for having it. Yeah, no, it's my pleasure. It's heavy too. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so this is not the title. I don't even know if I have the spelling of the name correct. And I don't know if Yuha is with us. Um, I don't think he's here, but okay. you do have the spelling of his name correct. Okay. Uh, okay. This is a really interesting image. Uh, it's once again coupled with other landscape uh, images that have animal motifs. So there's some really interesting conversations going on in the gallery. Uh, and it's got this quirky, strange mutant form in, in the, on the left-hand side. And, I, and, it, and it's almost as if, this, <laughs> I was thinking, the animals on the right are contemplating this weird, strange hybrid form and they're trying to make sense of it and I was trying to make sense of it and that's why I think I chose it so uh, we can keep going this is Kevin I've seen this piece before uh, this is a very strong piece uh, I don't know if I have the title correct but I think it is uh, it's a powerful piece it's a collage piece uh, you know, there's so much to be said about it and not enough time to, but I, I really thought, and this was something that a lot of the other works in the exhibition offered up. It was an image that was immediately recognizable and then it slipped into all kinds of other possible reads and ways of associating sense or making sense of it. Uh, the whole idea of nostalgia, the whole idea of like the passage of time and family, uh, of innocence, and then aging. Uh, so it, if Kevin's in the house, Kevin can weigh in. And I don't think Kevin is. See him. No. Okay. So it's a wonderful piece. And this is Nasir. And once again, in, 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 in complete candidacy, Nasir's in our uh, undergraduate program at PAPA. Uh, and I'm really familiar with the work. Nevertheless, it's in the show because it's warranted to be in the show because it's a very good painting. Uh, and I was mostly enamored of the way that the red side of the building sort of separates from a kind of like spatial logic and asserts itself almost in a flat graphic way. But if Nasir's in the house, I would welcome a comment. Um, I do not see Nasir on my list, no. Okay. All right. Well, he's one of your folks. He's a local Abington citizen. His piece is right next to this piece. So there's a really interesting conversation going on about like the color red and then this idea of architecture and or urban environment. So is Peter with us? Nope. Peter is with us? 
I do not see him on my list. No. Okay. Well, anyway, I, when I was showing this image to my students, they couldn't get enough of it. They loved it. I was really interested in the readability of it. It looks like it's almost a photograph, an aerial view of a city. And then obviously it's not because of the windows. And so it slips between readability and abstraction. Uh, and it's a wonderful piece. And we can keep moving on there, Gene. And this is Richard. And I think the piece is called Winter Crow. And it's a shaped object. It's a, it's a, it's a wall piece. Uh, so, you know, it, I was immediately struck obviously by the shape uh, and then the imagery, uh, which is pretty strong, pretty powerful. Uh, and then the materiality of it. it's a very physical piece. It's got, you know, it's, 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 it's like a low relief sculpture. So I'm not sure if Richard's with us. I don't see him now. Okay. Right. So we can keep going. And this is Sophia. Is Sophia with us? Yes, she is. Okay. Uh, I'm sorry, I don't have the title here. Uh, once again, this particular file was just a, a, a tool to get the final you know, choices down. Uh, but this is a, a wonderful piece that's very quirky and uh, it's a two dimensional piece, but you know, it's a woven piece. It's a tapestry of sorts. So all of the imagery that you're seeing here is actually like, once again, sort of a, a low relief sculpture. And if Sophia wants to weigh in on it, I would love to hear what Sophia has to say. Oh, sure. Hi, everyone. <laughs> um, and thank you for choosing the piece. Uh, it's called Pink Lady. Yeah. And its origin was that I had too much pink fiber laying around. And um, so then I decided to do a Victorian lady. And Victorians had the most amazingly weird hats. And I thought, what on earth would be the weirdest hat? Uh, and I was traversing the internet looking for images and I found a cartoon from that period of a Victorian lady wearing a hat that had a giant spider on it. And I thought, Tyrannosaurus Rex skull. Mm -hmm. So that was how that started to come about. And it's got beads and yarn and embroidery floss and the faces, you can't see it in the photo, but the face is entirely embroidered. Um, well, the whole thing is. And, um, and I just kept adding to it because the beauty of Victorian stuff is that you can, is that there's never a thing as too much, you know, um, but yeah, I was really excited to be included in the show. Yeah, no, it's a strong piece, and I couldn't, I, you know, I, I, I had to acknowledge, you know, the, the the humor of the piece. Obviously, that's an important part of it, uh, and the fact that you came up with uh, an, a a form that the Victorians wouldn't have been aware of, because you know, I don't think we had discovered dinosaurs yet. I could be wrong. I'm not a historian, but uh, I love the over the top nature of it. So you know, for me. <laughs> It can't get weird enough. <laughs> it can't get weird enough, right? So very good. Thank you. Okay. Is Susan with us? And this was an interesting painting because Susan submitted two other works that were nothing like this. <laughs> and once again, it reminded me uh, of when you have the opportunity to submit more than one I think it's a good idea to go with your intuition and not worry about whether the work seems consistent because uh, of the three, this was the one that I responded to most. And I was already thinking about the fact that it would work nicely with some of the other works that were somewhat abstract in nature uh, with regard to the imagery, but that also pointed towards other possibilities, in this case, a sort of landscape motif. So. That's all I have to say about that. This is Tyler Klein. This is a large piece. Once again, it's very physical. Uh, it traffics in all kinds of interesting conceptual elements. Uh, once again, it's highly detailed and very process oriented. Uh, so a lot of the shapes you're seeing, some of the a lot of the negative shapes in, the, in, in inside the image are actually truly negative shapes. Uh, you know, it's a collage piece. Uh, and once again, it's physically pretty Im imposing because it's about six feet tall. And uh, once again, I thought the play between positive and negative shapes was my in. And then 
you know, the, the other thing that was helpful was some of the uh, comments, uh, you know, when you when you submit a work of art, you're asked to talk about it. And then sometimes to a, to a juror, that can be very helpful. So I don't know if Tyler is with us. He's not here now. Okay, all right. So let's keep moving. So, and once again, full disclosure, I know Julia from PAPA. Pa uh, Julia recently graduated from the MFA program. And, and, and while Junior, Julia was there, she discovered uh, video as, as, as another medium uh, to add to her toolkit. Uh, so what you're seeing is a still from a video. And I think we were able to find an isolated place for Julia to display the works and to include uh, other videos in the exhibition. So once again, uh, ho hopefully everyone will get to see this. Is Julia with us? Yes, yes. I am. Hi, Julia. Hi, How the heck are you? I'm holding on. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Yes. Well, well, I was I was really excited about this piece. Uh, it seems like ages since we've actually been able to speak to one another in real time. Uh, yes. Have you seen the installation yet? I have, yeah, and in fact, I I went um, and I installed the projector, and um, you know, and with Jean's help too, we we found, as you uh, alluded to, um, a, a space within the art center, um, its own cozy little room <laughs> yeah. for the video work to be, um, where we could dim the light a little bit more, you know. Mm -hmm. Um, so I did, uh, I have seen it. And so, yeah, the, 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 thank you very much too for, um, I really was impressed when I was asking how you guys wanted this installed. I love that you said that you deferred to the artist than the institution. <laughs> I always defer to the artist, Julia, being one myself occasionally. Yes. Yeah. yeah. So, cause I, you know, if I had my druthers, I didn't want it projected. I didn't know how that would work out, but I'm glad Jean then thought of a way. Um, so there are two pieces, this video um, that you see a still of right now. Um, I'm very interested in, yeah, interactions between uh, the human and nature. Mm -hmm. And um, then uh, the second piece that I'd submitted that I also included, I, um, I was gla really glad to do that because it does, I shot it on the grounds of Abington Art Center yeah. and okay. the tower uh, by Winifred Lutz, which I'm, is a I'm little bit struggle. hidden within the woods, um, is featured in it. So, so you can go see the show, see the video, and then go walk through the woods and I'm go to the actual video. tower if you desire to, which has an exciting event coming up because the tower is built in relation to the motion of the sun. And at the winter solstice at noon, the light comes straight through this slit and then uh, goes through like some markings on the floor of the, the tower on the inside, which I find is really cool, really cool. Yeah. So, so hopefully folks will get to, you know, visit the exhibition See, see your installation. And before I forget, I, I want to make one more suggestion, Julia. And, mm -hmm. and once again, I should have run this by Jean, but I'm, I'm going to get fast and loose here. It might be worthwhile adding more videos to the, to the presentation, if that's okay with everyone in the room, right? Um, mm -hmm. I think the technology allows for that. And, and, and you could continue to, because I, I know you have other works in this vein, speak mm -hmm. to the you know, interaction between, you know, the figure in, with, within nature and landscape, and, and you have an environmental bent here uh, that's very purposeful. And I, and I think you're very clear about that in terms of wanting that to be, you know, part of the conversation. So you have other works that address that. So uh, it seems like the technology allows for potentially, sorry, Jean, the inclusion of more videos. It could be looped. Yeah, it does. And it wouldn't, it wouldn't, require any more wall space or anything it's all you got good. it exactly and it, it you get more bang for your buck as the viewer uh and and you'd get the work out there more so anyway uh, yeah well i really appreciate you choosing the work to be a part of the show too michael well you know i uh i i love the work and i and i love being able to share it you know in any way i can so uh how we doing gene I, I think, think I think we just have a, a couple more. I think want. this is the last one, Jean. Oh, okay, cool. Yeah. Is the artist in the house? 
I do not see her here now. Okay, so this is another really interesting piece. Uh, it's on silk, so it hangs. It's not stretched. It's, it's, it's free hanging. So it moves when you encounter it, and it has this strange translucency to it because it is silk. And then it has this very over-the-top potential narrative or narratives regarding a sort of landscape in which there's a sort of animal which sort of points towards the possibility of a, some kind of a rabbit contemplating some kind of image in the sky. So I thought about how interesting the narrative could slip into some kind of story about you know animals and animals taking on human characteristics and perhaps worshiping, worshiping gods and then this very strange like twist in which there's some kind of garment hanging from a hanger in the upper right. And, and the, the other interesting thing about this artist, and I'll finish with this idea, is that the other two works submitted were completely different. So once again, I, I thought the takeaway is when you are submitting for an exhibition and, and it's juried and you have the option of showing more than one piece, you know, obviously for most of us, the, the works will be similar because we'll be working, you know, perhaps a body of work. But if, if, if you're working in different medium with different imagery and subject matter, uh, don't be afraid, at least in my mind, to uh, submit works that sort of run the gamut. Because I don't know if I would have included the other two works, but this one I had to include. So I, I think that's the last image, Gene. Okay, I'm gonna stop sharing now. Um, okay. We went a little bit over, but not too much. Very good. Um, thank you everyone for coming. I wish there was time for questions and things like that. Um, there are um, images of the installation space on the website at abingtonartcenter.org. And I would just like to take the floor to thank all of you for coming and to thank Michael for coming and doing this for us. And uh, I want to hold out the hat to all of you guys. Um, so at Abington Art Center, we're a small nonprofit. Really, the entry fees for the exhibition pays for the exhibition. It's just enough money to pay our juror and to cover the show. So if you want to see more stuff from us, you have to, it sounds cheesy, but you have to be the change you want to see. You have to donate. You have to contribute to community centers like ours who provide this for um, everybody. So thank you all for all of your support. And I hope to see you guys at the exhibition in person really soon. So take care, everybody. All right. <laughs> Sorry about all the technical. It's no worries, Michael. Thank you, everyone. Thank, thank you. you. Michael, thank you, Jean. Thank you both. Thank you, thank Michael. You. Thank you, Jean. Have a great day. Happy holidays. You too, Bill. Thank you. Don't get sick, anyone. Take care. All right. mm -hmm.